speakers today. Um, first, I'm going to uh, go through some information about today's um, panel. I would like to actually invite Jose Fernandez, who is one of our Spanish language interpreters, to kick us off with our Spanish language interpretation. Jose? Thank you, Tueri. Muy buenas tardes a todos y muchas gracias por estar acompañándonos en la presentación del día de hoy. Quería avisarles que tenemos servicios de interpretación al español. Eh, para encender esa función, en unos momentos, lo que tienen que buscar es un, si están desde una computadora, Pueden buscar el icono de un globo en la parte de abajo de la pantalla en unos segundos, hacerle clic y seleccionar el español como su idioma. Si se están conectando por una tableta o un celular, tienen que buscar un menú de tres puntos suspensivos, hacerle clic ahí y seleccionar el español como su idioma. Ok, Melin, if you could please start the interpreting function. Thank you. Gracias, José. Con gusto. So, <laughs> Some housekeeping information. Um, if you look to the left of the slide, um, just a reminder for our panelists to please keep your microphone on mute while not speaking. And for all of our attendees, please feel free to include questions in the Q&A box that you have there. We have some folks behind the scenes that are doing live Q&A answering, and then we will have time within this presentation to answer some of your questions. So this is tonight's agenda. Uh, we will, I'm welcoming you all right now. We're going to do an overview of the Johnson and Johnson and vaccine timeline. We're going to talk about safety monitoring, case information on uh, the blood clot that is, has been associated with the Johnson Johnson vaccine, the decision uh, to pause and then unpause the vaccine and what Alameda County's response has been throughout this all. So what can you expect today? You can expect factual information from our health leaders who are joining us today on this call. Uh, we want to focus on the information that is most important to communities. And uh, as I had mentioned, your Q and A's will be answered um, via email. Oops, sorry, wrong button. Um, and uh, we really want you to be able to make informed decisions. So that's what we're doing here today. Who's on with us? Well, I am your host, your MC today. My name is Tuary Anderson, and I work for the Alameda County Healthcare Services Agency. I serve as the Director of Systems Integration for HCSA. And joining us today on our panel is Dr. Noha Abolata, the founder and CEO of Roots Community Health Center. She also has been doing a weekly uh, the People's Health Briefing for many, many months, almost, I guess it's almost a year now. And I know that Kimmy and Dr. Moss have both been uh, joined her in those endeavors. We have Dr. Nicholas Moss, who is our Alameda County Health Officer. And we have Kimmy Watkins-Tart, who is our Director of the Alameda County Public Health Department. Unfortunately, um, Dr. Kathleen Clannon could not join us today because she had a family emergency at the last moment. But no doubt we have our wonderful panel here who will be able to carry us through. So with that, I am going to start off with you, Dr. Abalata. Thanks, Tuari. Good evening, everyone. So I'm Dr. Noha Abalata, and um, just by way of reminder and overview, um, as I think most of us know, there are three COVID-19 vaccines that are approved under emergency authorization. The two on the left there, the Pfizer and the Moderna, are the ones that came out first, and those are the mRNA vaccines that are the two-dose regimen. Uh, three weeks apart and four weeks apart respectively. And then the Johnson & Johnson, which is a little bit different type of vaccine. It uses what's called an adenoviral vector. And that is the one dose vaccine. All three of these vaccines in the clinical trials proved to be 100% effective on preventing death from COVID-19. And so this is probably the most remarkable aspect of all of these vaccines is that it is preventing death and they're all excellent at preventing hospitalization and severe illness. Even though we like to kind of put it on the slide in a side-by-side -side way, I do just like to caution that this is not really a head-to-head -head comparison here. In order to do that, you would really need a trial 
uh, with each group getting the, the different vaccine, when in fact, what happened is that each of these clinical trials was done at a different time period in different parts of the world even, and with the presence of different variants. And so we can't really compare them head to head, but I think bottom line is that they've all been incredibly effective in preventing severe illness and death from COVID-19. We can go through it, thank you. Now, this is one of the lovely um, uh, pieces of the dashboard that you can pull up from Alameda County uh, Department of Public Health's COVID-19 uh, dashboard that has all kinds of information for those who are interested. And one of those parts of information is this right here, the vaccination dashboard. And it gives by city, by age, by race of who we have been able to vaccinate, but really just wanted to point your attention here to the fact that we have been uh, vaccinating eligible folks at a pretty good rate here. We're already almost up to 70% of those who are eligible, which is those who are 16 and up. So 68.8% of those who are 16 and up have, have had at least one dose and 42.6% have been fully vaccinated. And just to kind of give us a timeline, I think what I wanted to point out here is that these trials have started quite some time ago. And so with the Moderna and the Pfizer, we're talking about uh, already March, April of 2020. So over a year ago that their clinical trials started, the Johnson & Johnson started in mid-July and the emergency use authorizations were granted for Pfizer and Moderna just a week apart in mid-December. And then in uh, February, late February, um, February 27th, the Johnson & Johnson was granted the emergency use authorization. And a few days later, uh, it began being distributed in the United States. And within about six weeks was when the pause occurred. And so that was on April 13th. And I'll talk about that on the next slide a little bit about what, what prompted that. Um, and after about 10 days of additional review and a lot of communication, uh, the Johnson & Johnson was then unpaused on April 23rd. And I wanted to also just point out that now that, um, that we will be you know, six months out from the emergency use um, very soon with both the Pfizer and Moderna, but we are already six months out in terms of experience with those vaccines and seeing um, their continued effectiveness and continued safety as well. So just kind of wanted to point that out in the grand scheme of the timeline. And I think the only other thing I would say is that with all vaccines, we expect to see uh, adverse effects within six to eight weeks. And I think that that kind of goes right along with when we saw the signal, when the regulators and the scientists kind of saw the signal with Johnson & Johnson was right around that time frame after it was um, released. And so the VAERS system is our uh, early warning system is kind of a joint venture between CDC and the FDA. It's the Vaccine Adverse Event Reporting System. And this is like a gigantic repository of uh, any kind of report that comes after vaccination. So this could be um, the individual who got the vaccine, their caregiver, the doctor, the hospital that makes these reports. And so this is kind of a huge kind of clearinghouse of all kinds of information of what happens after the vaccine, whether or not it was actually related to the vaccine. And then that becomes the job of kind of our regulators and our scientists who pour through this information and identify signals and different things that are popping up that seem um, different from what we would call the background rate of something. So if something just happens at a normal rate, then that is what is compared. And what was identified here um, through this system, and then it was also checked against other systems, but was um, the cerebral venous sinus thrombosis, which is a clot that forms in the vessels that drain blood from the brain. And this is something that we, we know about. This has happened before, this is not unheard of. But what was very unusual in this case is that it was happening in, at the same time that patients were experiencing thrombocytopenia or a low platelet count. And so at the same time that there was a clot, there's also a condition that uh, keeps you from clotting. And so one of the reasons why the pause was put into place so quickly, even though 
they only found this in six people. So if you can imagine six people where this CVST along with the low platelet count occurred out of almost 7 million doses that had been administered by that time. But part of the reason for this, and I think it's a very good and reassuring reason is that we really needed to put everyone on notice, the public on notice, and especially medical providers and hospitals on notice. And the reason why that was so critical is because when you have this clot at the same time as the low platelets, the normal treatment for the clot could actually be dangerous because of the low platelets. And so really it was critical that we get everyone's attention immediately so that if this did present at one of our hospitals or doctor's offices, that the providers would know what to look for, what tests to run, and what kind of unique treatment would need to be administered at that time. The other reason, of course, was to give the scientists and the regulators time to really review and see if they could find additional cases, and to also put everyone on notice so that if any of the symptoms or signs of this condition were to occur in an individual who got the vaccine, that they know that they should seek out medical attention and also that they should let the provider know, hey, I got this vaccine, I got it on this day. And what that also does is then triggers those providers to make this report into this reporting system. And so this is one of the things that we have in place that creates a way for us to say if something happened, even if we're not sure if it was a vaccine or not, we can at least report it and that this really is being reviewed. And there's quite a lot of information there. It's actually publicly available for anyone to go in and look at. And it's just really important to underscore the fact that this system is not designed to determine any kind of cause and effect. That is the job of a whole lot of other people that are overseeing this effort but it is a place where all of this information is sort of deposited. Thank you, Dr. Noha. Dr. Moss. Thanks, Tuary. Hi, everyone. Um, glad to be here. So, um, so you know, uh, picking up where Noha left off, when the um, pause happened, they, they wanted to see if there were more cases out there, CDC and FDA. Um, there were a few more cases reported. And this slide summarizes the final uh, data. Um, and um, it was only a handful of additional cases. It wasn't dozens, wasn't hundreds. Um, it was, it was just, a, just another handful. And so um, this slide helps you kind of see what those numbers look like in the end. Uh, seven uh, reports of this condition per million women less than age 50. And this, this is the, the, most of the cases were in this group. Um, that works out to be about one in 140,000. For uh, women older than 50, it's lower. They found about one case in a million. And then for men uh, less than age 50, uh, they found about one case in 500,000 people who got the vaccine and uh, none in, in older men. Uh, and so um, the CDC used this information um, and the FDA, they used this information that they got from that reporting system very comprehensive safety reporting system in order to um, make a determination for, um, for what to do. And they compared this information to the other risks, the risks that, from COVID. Um, so on the next slide, we can look at some of those other risks. So the risk of getting COVID in the US is very high. One in 11 Americans have got COVID so far. And the risk of dying is pretty high too certainly when you compare it to the risk of that um, uh, clotting condition, one in 664 Americans so far. And actually, I think it's, that number is gonna change because people are still dying of COVID um, uh, right now. Uh, so, um, you know, very, COVID is much riskier just in terms of the numbers. Um, and then what about other things? So death from a bee sting, uh, one in about 60,000. Uh, people per year. Um, and then getting struck by lightning is about, uh, it's 1.2 per million per year. So just a little bit higher than one in a million. So that kind of puts it in context and I think explains why the pause was ended 
and the, um, the Advisory Committee on Immunization Practices, which is the experts, uh, the extra expert committee at CDC weighed in and CDC and FDA agreed that the, the, the benefits of this vaccine far outweighed uh, the risks. Um, next slide, please. And so um, as a result of that, um, the, the pause was ended um, and um, uh, the California Department of Public Health and the uh, separate uh, Western State Scientific Safety Review Committee, which is experts from um, California, Washington, and Oregon, and I believe Nevada, um, separately reviewed all the information. They agreed with the CDC and FDA decision. Um, and um, uh, the CDPH required patient education, which was part of um, part of the outcome of the pause is that a warning statement would be required uh, for, um, for the vaccine. And the California Department of, of Public Health um, uh, has required patient education reflecting this uh, warning. Um, and the uh, uh, Association of Bay Area Health Officials, um, that's uh, uh, people like me uh, from all of the uh, Bay Area counties, um, we uh, reviewed all the information as well, and we, we also supported this decision. Um, and so that brings us to um, where we're able to use this again, but it's important for people to understand this risk, and that's why the warning statements uh, are required and are uh, now included. Thank you, Dr. Moss. Kimmy. Yes. Uh, good evening. And so I'm going to talk about uh, where we are now with resuming uh, the use of J&J &J, um, and what our plans are for vaccine uh, in Alameda County. We will uh, be resuming uh, next week in most of our county run sites. Um, as Dr. Moss mentioned, there will also be additional information distributed uh, from CDPH educational information to provide additional information about um, the vaccine. Uh, this information will be available in multiple languages um, that's in development as well as a stakeholder um, educational um, information is also in development so that if you are an organization that works with individuals and helps them to uh, register for vaccine or, or gives them education around vaccine, um, th there's information uh, available for you as well. Um, the uh, vaccination program for our homebound um, uh, people has already resumed and the uh, early information is um, that it is going quite well. And as before, residents can see the vaccine type uh, when they're scheduling their appointments. Next slide. In Alameda County, uh, vaccines are provided in a variety of different uh, locations and uh, by a variety of different providers or vaccinators. And so our county website is an excellent place to go to see where you can find a vaccine. The first place, of course, is to uh, reach out to your healthcare provider um, if your healthcare provider uh, is vaccinating. That's the first place. Um, to look to. Uh, after that, you know, our website, there's the county fairgrounds we have. We have the Coliseum. We also have community-based sites at Fremont High School, as well as Hayward Adult School. And we also have Buchanan Parking at Golden Gate Fields. Um, one of the things that we have been uh, working to do uh, throughout this time is to ensure that we are locating vaccine uh, opportunities in those communities that have been especially hard hit by COVID. And we will continue that work um, through establishing additional community sites. Um, the DP Stokeland site should be opening in about a week, um, followed by a, a, a locations in both West Oakland as well as in South Hayward and in South County and, um, uh, and possibly also at uh, locations, pop-ups in uh, East County as well. We want to make sure, as I mentioned, that um, everyone who wants a vaccine can get a vaccine and we are encouraging 
everyone to um, get vaccinated, to get the information that you need, talk to the people you need to talk to, ask the questions that you need to ask. Um, but at the end of the day, we do believe that um, this is something that we all need to do and should do. Um, and there are three vaccines available uh, to all of us in our county. Um, next slide, yes. Um, you can also find uh, an appointment um, by going to our website. Um, again, checking with your health provider. And there's a lot of information there on our website um, around how you can be notified, how you can schedule an appointment. And right now, as we speak, there are a lot of appointments available. And so if you have not yet gotten your vaccine or you are working with people who have not yet gotten their vac vaccine, uh, now is a really good time. Uh, to schedule an appointment. There are lots of appointments available right now. Thank you. Thank you, Kimmy. And we'll just end with this with you, Dr. Moss. Uh, so um, just a reminder for everyone that um, we're in a, a, a good place with um, the vaccines being available and many county residents already vaccinated. Of course, many people still to be vaccinated. But uh, all of the other things that um, we have been doing to keep each other safe from COVID are still really important, even as we are in this new phase and have um, lower case rates locally, it's still circulating. We're still hearing about uh, COVID cases every day, even people in the hospital. Um, so it's important, wear a face covering uh, when you leave the house, uh, when you're gathering um, in certain situations, uh, you still have to wear a face covering. Um, make sure it's over your nose and mouth. Keep uh, washing your hands. CDC uh, this week did uh, announce that vaccinated people uh, doing activities outside don't need to wear a mask unless they're in crowded settings. And that's great. So if you're, if you're vaccinated and there's not a lot of people around, you're out, outdoors, it's fine for you to take the mask off. But if there are a lot of people around, um, it's important to keep that mask on uh, there's still a little bit of risk of COVID and we want to keep each other safe. Indoor settings, masks going to continue to be important for most people uh, anytime it's a, it's a public place. Thank you, Dr. Moss. And I'll just end with our, um, I'm not ending the presentation, just to be clear, we'll have time for Q&A, but here's some additional sources of information uh, that you can continue to stay informed around uh, vaccine and COVID-19 information. Uh, every other Tuesday at 5.30 p.m., we have a public meeting, which is our Vaccine Community Advisory Board. Um, and that is the URL there. It is live streamed as well. So please do join us for that. Um, we do weekly COVID-19 updates and you can find presentations and newsletters um, at that particular URL. And we do have um, updates like Dr. Noha was saying um, on and uh, Kimmy were saying on our website, um, COVID19ACGov.org slash vaccine. So there's a lot of information on our county websites. And if you're on social, please do join Alameda County Healthcare Services Agency on social. Um, we're on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, and YouTube uh, at Dare to Be Well. And I just want to say thank you uh, for your patience. I know we've had some challenges with pinning our ASL interpreter. Uh, hopefully she's there now and everybody can see her. So I appreciate the patience and the support for that. I am going to stop sharing um, and I will open it up to our panelists uh, to answer questions. I know that we have one particular question in the chat. Um, oh, and it looks like Dr. Moss is typing an answer. So the question is, please clarify the J&J &J vaccine for those with low platelets. I have low platelets reported one month ago at 87. I'm assuming age 87. Dr. Moss or Dr. Noha, do you want to answer that question? Uh, well, uh, I can answer and Noha, feel free to jump in. So um, it's a great question. And um, uh, you know that it does happen. Some people have uh, low, uh, low platelets and it can happen for a number of reasons. Now, if you have low platelets, because, and uh, blood clots together, if you have one of these types of syndromes that looks like what we're talking about, where you have low platelets, but also you have a problem with clotting, 
then it is recommended that you get a different type of vaccine. Um, for other uh, people with low platelets, um, there isn't a, a, a recommendation against the Johnson & Johnson vaccine at this time, but I do suggest that anybody with uh, questions or medical issues speak to their healthcare provider if they have one um, uh, and make sure because um, sometimes um, um, the healthcare provider has more detailed understanding of, of um, the condition and, and can help you make this decision. Yeah, that's great. I don't have anything other to other to add. I think the only official sort of recommendation around this is like what Dr. Ma said, if there was sort of an immune reason why the low platelet count or a history of this um, same kind of picture or a similar kind of picture, like hep, what they call heparin-induced thrombocytopenia, those would be reasons to possibly, you know, avoid this one and get uh, get one of the others, uh, and always going to echo any plug to talk with your primary care provider about anything like your blood pressure, your diabetes, and all the other things that we want, you know, we want controlled uh, in general, uh, but certainly if there's questions about the vaccine, that's the perfect person to talk to. The vast, vast majority of people um, any chronic conditions that you may have put you at much higher risk of doing poorly with COVID and actually were reasons why we wanted you at the front of the line uh, for the vaccine and not the opposite. So I hear a lot of people sort of asking, well, I have, uh, I don't know about my immune system. I have diabetes. Well, no, actually um, that is where uh, we know that you're at greater risk of doing poorly with COVID and we actually want you to pri be prioritized in terms of, of getting the vaccine. Um, and maybe I'll just take this moment to add that, um, you know, in this pandemic, we've seen that if, if, if you get COVID-19, the, on average, the risk of dying from COVID-19 is one in 56. So, and, and the risk of going to the hospital is about one in 20. So these, these are, these are um, concerning numbers. And so, um, so just wanted to kind of put that into context as well, that if you are not protected, and you do catch COVID-19, the risk of dying from COVID-19 is about one in 56. And that's on average. If you're, of course, older or in high-risk categories, it will be even higher than that. Thank you, Dr. Noha, that's helpful. So I am getting some questions on my text. You might've been hearing that come through and also in the Q&A, just a reminder to folks, we're not doing uh, raising hands to answer um, questions. So if you do have a question, please put it in the Q&A box in the chat. And so I have a question um, from both the, the Q&A and it looks like an email, there, there are similar questions. Um, I'll answer this first one. If I get a vaccine, J and J or other, and later in the year I get COVID, what should I do? Dr. Noha or Dr. Moss? Well, I, the most important thing is uh, to stay home um, unless you need medical care. So um, people, the vaccines are very good. They're not perfect. We knew this even from the clinical trials, and there are going to be occasional people who get uh, COVID, even though they've been vaccinated. Um, that's why we want to get as many people vaccinated as possible. It just reduces the amount of COVID that can be in the environment. And it just reduces the chance of these rare uh, COVID infections in people who are vaccinated. So, uh, but if you do get it, even if you've been vaccinated, you can be infectious to other people. Stay home. Um, we know from the trials that um, people who, for whom this happens, they're very unlikely to get severe disease. If you need medical care, absolutely seek it out. Um, and um, there's, uh, um, uh, you know, at this time, there's, uh, those are the really the most important things. Noah, did I miss anything in terms of uh, next steps? I don't think you miss anything. I'll just say that I like the question because that implies that you got a COVID test. And so I think um, what we want to sort of underscore is that at this point, um, like Dr. Ma said, we we know we we were so, um, I think, you know, surprised, pleasantly surprised that we could say 94, 95% effective. I mean, this is um, incredibly effective compared to even most of the vaccines that we're used to and that we rely upon. And so I think that that was tremendous and is tremendous, uh, but that still leaves, you know, five, six percent of people that will get it. And so um, even though a lot of the things will change for you after you're vaccinated, for example, uh, you won't have to do the quarantine after travel 
or necessarily um, after exposure. And, and the exception to that is if you're a healthcare worker. Uh, but for the most part, uh, you know, you, those things will change for you. However, we are urging that if you get symptoms of COVID uh, after you've been vaccinated, then we do want you to get tested just for the very reasons that Dr. Moss pointed out, which is that we don't want it to be spread to others. And so what we get concerned about is that for those who are unvaccinated, uh, they're still at just as much risk as ever really at this point. In fact, I think we're getting more and more concerned about unvaccinated people and their risk um, as time goes on and as we have more variants and other things like that. So I think we want to be protecting all of the unvaccinated people. And remember that by definition includes everyone that's 16 and under. Uh, and then also those who have not yet been vaccinated um, so I think the key is that if you get symptoms, we still want you to get tested. And then from there, everything's going to be the same, just like what Dr. Ma said, we're still going to need uh, the isolation period to happen. We're still going to need to call contacts and make sure they get tested and they isolate. So from there, it's basically the same. Thank you so much. We actually have another question in the Q&A that is, um, I think, related to what you both were just answering, which is, shouldn't we still get tested after receiving a vaccine? Well, that's, uh, uh, so this is a, a, an area where, um, uh, you know, things are, are kind of changing as we learn and see how effective the vaccines are. Um, and um, the, um, there are uh, certainly, you, as Noha was saying, if you're, if you're feeling sick, doesn't matter if you got vaccinated, it's important to get tested. Um, if you were um, a close contact of somebody, if you're vaccinated and you're a close contact of somebody who has COVID, currently the CDC is saying that you don't need to be tested. Now, there may be situations where we at the health department ask you to, to, to test, um, but, uh, but the recommendations are changing at this time where you don't necessarily need to be tested for an exposure if you've been vaccinated. And then the other thing that I think we're still kind of learning what makes the most sense is uh, for people in certain occupations where testing has really been important to keep um, those uh, that they work with, for example, in certain healthcare settings, um, keep them safe from COVID. Um, uh, as more and more of those folks get vaccinated, we're rethinking what the best strategy is there. So if you work in one of those fields where testing has uh, been important to happen regularly, um, it's still a bit of a work in progress. Thank you, Dr. Moss. Um, another question from our Q&A, do you think we will get boosters like we do with the influenza vaccine every year? So I think, you know, we would all be just trying to tell the future with this one. So I'll just take a stab and then Dr. Moss can add. So, um, you know, right now, the reason why I mentioned the six month of data with the Pfizer, for example, is that right now we can say, you know, that the, co the coverage and the protection is looking great after six months. And then every day is like, and every week is like, okay, six months in a day, six months in a week, seven months, eight months. So as more time goes, we can keep adding to that time frame because I do hear a lot of, well, it's only good for six months. Okay, no, that's, that's not it. It's that's all we can say for sure because that's the only amount of time we have under our belt, right? Um, and so that, that's what we're looking at and that's what keeps on being monitored. I think what I'll say about the booster is that there's two things kind of at play when we talk about a booster. One is, will we need to be boosted from that original vaccine we got against that original kind of COVID? And the other is, Will COVID keep circulating around and mutating to where we have new variants and now we need a, another, it's really not really a booster in that case, I think, but, but that might be semantics. But at that point, we'd really need a vaccine against the new type. And we're really hopeful because we are still in a race. Um, we really are hopeful that we will reach that herd immunity before that happens. Um, and so that we won't need, you know, some kind of vaccine that includes against all the different, against the, all the different types. And so I think that, you know, there is a possibility certainly that we will need boosters, but I think a lot of that is going to depend on all the factors that we're really, we're really kind of still in the thick of it. I know we're feeling pretty good about how we're doing here in California, but remember that this is a worldwide situation. It's still an evolving situation. It's a situation where parts of the world and even parts of the country are uh, headed in the wrong direction with this. And so I think it's really important that, um, we, we stay mindful of that. And so I think there's a lot of factors that go into answering that question. But the best part about it is that that is a knowable 
uh, question, right? These studies are continuing to be done as we go. And so I think we'll have the information that, okay, after this much time, we really are gonna need a booster. Okay, now we have this much variant, we're gonna need you know, another vaccine. And so I think um, you know, really the, the hope and the thought at this point is that we'll know in time to make that recommendation and to make that happen. And we'll have all this great infrastructure built to do mass vaccination delivery if and when that time comes. Thank you so much, Dr. Noha. So I'm gonna take the two questions that we had uh, received from email. Um, and it's, it's almost like a two-part question. Uh, can individuals who got the J&J &J vaccine choose other vaccines in the future? And then the second part of that question is how long should one wait after J&J &J to get Pfizer or Moderna? Well, I, I, you know, I think uh, uh, I'm glad that we got these questions because it gives me the chance to say that you don't need to get one of those other vaccines if you got J&J. &J. Um, the, the, all this stuff about the J&J &J pause, that wasn't about whether or not it works. It, it works. And um, so far, um, it's been, been working very well. And I think it's a great addition. Um, so there's, uh, there's no reason right now that we would see to recommend that you got a different vaccine if you got any of them. Um, and um, I think, uh, you know, the issue of boosters is a different one. And and as Noha said, we're gonna learn more as we go. Um, and at some point we may need boosters as we do with other certain other types of vaccines. But in terms of, 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 of you know, if you got one, now you need the other, no, that's not recommended right now. I don't see any reason why you would need to do that. Great, thank you so much, Dr. Moss. We have um, more questions coming in uh, through our uh, webinar q and A. I I just wanna encourage our attendees to keep putting questions in there. Um, the next two are related to children. The first question is, how close are we to vaccines for children and youth under age 16? Schools have opened back up and some are COVID testing the students who are returning back to campus. Uh, uh, my uh, understanding is we're expecting a decision on the Pfizer vaccine for 12 to 15 year olds uh, getting emergency youth, uh, use authorization, same type of authorization as the other vaccines in the next um, uh, month or two. Um, it's, I, I haven't seen an exact timeline. Um, and so that'll be good. That'll be a, a big step forward. A, 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 you know, a lot more people in our, a lot, a lot more county residents who have a, an option. Um, for younger children, I think it's gonna take longer. Those, uh, it's just earlier on in the process, they were not the first um, population studied for, for a number of reasons. Um, and I, I don't know if we'll get um, a, a vaccine for them before the end of this year, uh, maybe. Um, maybe. Maybe it's early uh, 2022. Um, so, um, so more uncertainty there. And I would just add that in the meantime, we really do want some vigilance around testing for young people. Um, I know that very early on in the pandemic, we kind of said, oh, kids are fine. They do fine. And they usually do. Um, but kids can get long COVID. Um, just like adults, and maybe even at the same rate as adults, um, kids can get inflammatory conditions uh, as well, and sometimes those can be serious. And if a young person uh, gets COVID, the recommendation now is that for them to return to sports, they actually need a cardiology, a, a cardiac examination. So that might just be questions, it might be EKG, it might be more than that. So those are all reasons why we just need to know um, if a young person is positive and they may not have symptoms at all, but yet the things I just mentioned are still important and still relevant. And so that's the reason why um, certainly if there's symptoms or there's exposure that it's important to test. Yeah, thank you so much for that. Um, yes, Dr. Moss. Yeah, I was just gonna add, and it's just a reminder that there's a lot of people that can't get vaccinated right away. And that's why we need to you know, those of us who can get vaccinated, it's really important because it helps us protect them. And, um, and it's important to do these other things. I know we're reopening, we're loosening a lot of restrictions and that's a good thing, but um, the stuff that's still in place, it's real important to stick to that so we can protect our children. 
Yes, thank you so much. I just want to let our attendees know that you can place questions in the Q&A in Spanish, and we will translate those questions into English for you. One of our background folks can do that translation. Um, so please do place your questions in chat in Spanish, and we'll be able to answer them. Okay, uh, next question. My daughter, who's 17, got vaccinated with one dose. And she wants to be tested before visiting her grandma in a few days. Does she need to be tested or not? She is at doing school at home. So um, let's see. Um, if she if she's uh, received a one dose vaccine, the Johnson and Johnson, which is a one dose vaccine, and she's two weeks out. Uh, meaning she's fully vaccinated and her grandmother is fully vaccinated two weeks out from her last shot, whether it's a one shot or a two shot series, um, then uh, they, I, I don't think a test is required in that situation. Um, and um, if, it's a, if it's a different kind of vaccine, then she's not considered fully vaccinated and um, she can still visit with her grandmother, um, but face coverings, outdoors, those things are, um, are recommended. Um, a test would certainly um, give uh, added reassurance. Um, it's not required, um, but it, it, it is, um, you know, it, it's not a bad idea. Um, so it's a bit nuanced depending on, uh, you know, whether she's fully vaccinated or not. And, and I, I can't tell from the question, I'm sorry. The only other thing I would say is that it did mention that she was schooling at home and just a reminder that uh, those other other people who live in the household can be exposing people who are living at home. So and then everything Dr. Ma said about whether or not she's fully vaccinated and of course, uh, grandma uh, being fully vaccinated as well. Great. Thank you both so much. I am going to give you two a break um, and uh, Punt this next question to you, Kimmy. How is the homebound vaccination program being prioritized? For example, zip code, city, et cetera. Um, so the right now we are really looking at, you know, where we identify uh, homebound adults. And so um, homebound people, not just adults, actually. Sorry for that. And so um, there aren't, you know, a, a, so many individuals that we really need to prioritize by zip code. And so we're really trying to reach anybody who is homebound and can't leave their home and needs a, and needs a vaccine. Um, and so I think if, I, if I'm interpreting this question correctly, we're not needing to prioritize at this point by zip code for people who are homebound. That's great. Thank you, Kimmy. And if I'm if I am correct that you're right about that, that the numbers aren't so big in our really large county that we're able through a lot of logistical planning and everything and uh, support from uh, transportation agencies, home care workers and just a really big network um, of providers we're able to reach those um, homebound folks. Mm -hmm. So thanks for that. Great question, thank you so much. Keep them coming, everybody. We still have a few minutes. Okay, I do have another question on deck. Uh, in regard to the CDC guidelines for fully vaccinated people getting together, what constitutes a medium-sized group? How many households of vaccinated people could safely gather? Uh, thank you for the question. I, it's, you know, I actually have this guidance open in front of me and I, I'm not, I, I may have missed it. If somebody else saw it, please jump in. I did not see them define um, in great detail um, medium-sized groups. Um, uh, generally speaking, um, large gatherings, they have large gatherings and small gatherings and large gatherings, which is where you'd want to um, uh, for example, keep masking up. Those are people from multiple households. They don't specify a number. Um, often it's sort of large planned events, a party with a lot of guests and invitations, maybe people traveling, maybe it's an organized thing um, with tickets. And then a small gathering is like uh, at somebody's house, 
uh, friends and family, nobody's traveling that far. So if you're talking about people from around the neighborhood, a few households getting together and everyone is vaccinated, remember um, young people often haven't been vaccinated because we don't have a vaccine for them yet. Um, if you're talking about that situation, then I would consider that a small gathering and you could apply those CDC um, you know, more relaxed restrictions if people are vaccinated. Uh, I don't think there's a middle ground, but I may have missed it. Thank you, Dr. Moss. Um, so we don't have any questions in the Q&A, but I, um, uh, Dr. Burns, if you could put your question in the Q&A, that would be very helpful. I'm so glad that you are on here. Um, so I do have a question for you, Kimmy, um, that is sort of related to the question around um, prioritization for homebound folks. Um, what is Alameda County doing in the public health department in particular around reducing disparities for our COVID-19 response? Not a little question, Tori. <laughs> no, it's not. But I think high level, like what what are we doing? I think there's many strategies, and I'm happy to jump in as well. No, I'm jo I'm joking. I'm just teasing you. So, um, you know, we have seen uh, the disparities in COVID from the very start, and unfortunately, we actually could have predicted this that um, in many of the health uh, areas that we monitor on a regular basis, we see uh, certain communities um, not faring as well as others, whether it be chronic diseases like uh, hypertension, like diabetes, like the cancers, uh, like HIV. And so with COVID, we've also similarly seen these disparities. And so the way that we've approached this is by um, one of the first things that we did was to implement a community-based approach um, to this work. And so that approach is not a new approach for us. Uh, here in Alameda County, we have a wide network of community-based organizations that, that provide a wide array of services uh, in Alameda County. And so we uh, implemented a community-based case and contact investigation and testing um, at the very, um, that, that was the first thing that we did. Um, this was actually very new for the public health department. We had never um, in a major way um, expanded our case and contact investigation work to community partners. And so that was a very steep climb and I want to take my hat off and, sh and, sh and give a shout out to uh, Tori Anderson for really um, leading the implementation of that new design for us. Um, and it really helped us to bridge um, a sometimes pretty, pretty wide gap between uh, the health department staff and the communities we were trying to reach through the phone calls. These were people who were from their community speaking their language, oftentimes representing organizations that they were more familiar with than with the health department to talk to them about their COVID test. Um, also offering COVID testing in trusted places like their community clinic, like a church that they attend, like another faith-based organization that they attend, or other community uh, locations that are more accessible and more comfortable um, for uh, receiving the test. Um, we are taking that same approach with the vaccine, uh, implementing a vaccine at the community level, making sure that people are able to receive the vaccine in settings that are comfortable for them, being delivered by people who are comfortable to them and who are familiar um, with them, who speak their language, who look like them, who are in their community and um, really um, create an atmosphere of, of trust and, and of comfort. The other way is to really target uh, that we've approached the disparities is to really make sure that we are focusing a disproportionate amount of our resources in those zip codes that the data has shown really carry the heaviest burden of COVID this entire time. And so um, we're not talking about equality, like everyone gets a penny or everyone gets a nickel. We're really talking about giving more where more is needed. And um, that has been a very challenging approach, but in a very effective one and one that you have to implement when you're trying to close those gaps. So those are the two biggest um, approaches, ways that we've addressed uh, the disparities. Community-based, 
and targeted. Thank you, Kimmy. And I swear that wasn't a tee up for me. Uh, I just want to say and thank you for the gratitude. <laughs> I appreciate that. It's been my pleasure. And I also want to thank um, Dr. Noha as one of our and Roots as one of our early partners in that CICT endeavor. It's been just tremendous, most definitely. Um, the other thing, if I may, Kimmy, to add to what you were saying that I think is really wonderful that's currently happening um, through our vaccination sites and our community pods um, and really making sure that our county run community pods are in those areas like you were mentioning that have the heaviest disease burden and really partnering with our community organizations in those areas to help do navigation to those pod sites. I know we had a slide um, and pod, sorry, everybody stands for point of dispensing. Um, and I know that you had a slide for those, the two pods that we have up and running currently, um, which is Fremont High School in Oakland and then Hayward Adult School for Ashland, Cherryland, and Hayward Acres areas. And um, so that, that's also something that's part of that whole community partnership continuum to address the health disparities. Right. Great. I, I would say that we have very loosely talked, I said, kind of passed over the whole notion of pop-up um, in terms of the vaccines. We use the same approach with testing where we bring testing or vaccine to wherever people naturally gather and where they're comfortable um, coming. And so it might be there for a day or two, it might come back to that location or go somewhere else. And so um, we have found that approach for both testing and for vaccination to be really, really effective at reaching people who would not come to a community-based vaccine site, even if the community-based vaccine site is in their zip code and somewhat close to where they live, we still are seeing people choosing to use pop-up locations because they feel more comfortable, they're more intimate, they're smaller, and they're usually being um, coordinated by a community partner that they know and they recognize. Thank you, Kimmy. To, oh, sorry, I just wanted to add on the disparities. I think that the county has done an amazing job of really being focused and targeted. And despite that, we still have really wide disparities and we have a lot of work to do. Um, so some facts that have remained unchanged, like Kimmy said, almost since the beginning, um, are that our Latino population is getting COVID at about double the rate of everyone else and African-Americans are dying at almost double the rate of everyone else. And so these are really wide disparities that we have to be concerned about. And then when we go to our vaccination rates, these are the two groups with the lowest vaccination rates. And so I think what I would say is a couple of things. One is that to Kimmy's point, there are trusted locations um, throughout the county and in the community. Uh, we can answer questions that you have. This isn't about um, you know, trying to convince anyone of anything. It's about you assessing the fact, every individual saying, my risk if I catch COVID of dying is one in 56. So what is it that I need to do to protect myself? And how can I make sure that all the questions that I have about the vaccine, which is really the tool that we have, we have other tools, we have masks, we have distancing, and we need to do all of those things. But, um, you know, for whatever, better or worse, right? The vaccine is the way out of the pandemic. And we, and if someone has another way out, please tell me because I haven't been able to figure it out. There is not another way out. I wish there was, I really truly, I mean, this is not what any of us I think would have hoped. It could have, I wish it would have burned out like SARS, right? But that didn't happen. And here we are and, and we don't see another way out. And so therefore, if you're someone who still has questions uh, we want to hear those questions. We want to get those questions answered so that you will have all the information you need to make the best choice for yourself and for your family and for your loved ones. The other thing I would say is that we have choices, right? And I don't know if that's always going to be the case. I don't know if at some point it's going to be like, well, we ran out of this one. And so now all you got is that one. But we do have three good choices, right? And if you have reasons why you're feeling like you're not sure about one or the other, that's okay because there's two other choices to choose from. And one thing that I think um, we're seeing is that most all the sites are gonna tell you which one is being offered uh, that day at that site. And so you have the opportunity um, to make an informed choice and informed decision and no one is trying to impose one thing or another 
on you. And again, we just don't know, you know, we've seen all kinds of things with supply and demand with vaccines already so far. So I can only speak for today what's going on is that there's capacity in your community, not far from where you live, um, from people that you trust. I can just about guarantee that. Um, and you should let us know, let the public health department know if, that, if that's not the case, if we need more access. But right now it really does appear that we have great access to all three vaccines for everybody. And so now is also a good time. If you weren't one of those people rushing to the front of the line and elbowing everyone out of the way, because there was a lot of those folks, I think they've all gotten their vaccine now. So for those who were like, okay, I'm gonna wait till I don't have to stand in line around the block. This is, this is that time. That time. We're here. That's, that's great. Thank you, Noha. There are three questions in the chat. I'm going to give us time to answer one more. Um, so uh, Kimmy, if you could check the chat and answer the one about the pop-up clinics. And Nick, I'm going to ask you to do double duty, which is around the face shield question. But the question that I would like answered live, I think it's on everybody's mind. When will Alameda County get to the yellow tier? And does it depend on how many people get the vaccine? So uh, it does not depend on how many people get the vaccine. Um, in some small counties, uh, vaccine is taken into account with the tier system, I believe, but but not in Alameda, not in large counties, not in Alameda County. It's uh, um, uh, how many uh, people have COVID uh, and um, what our test positivity is. And, uh, you know, we have been... Um, Actually, we were our, our numbers uh, bumped up a little bit uh, over the last week. Um, they're still very low in the orange tier, but just not zero. COVID is around, uh, but they've been overall very um, steady since uh, really the end of February. And and I frankly am not certain that they're going to drop uh, further. Um, people are traveling. Um, there's a lot of people who could still get COVID in Alameda County. We're we're loosening up the restrictions. Um, we're going to keep seeing transmission here. So I, I, I'm not sure that we're going to actually see the yellow tier, but the state is planning to lift all of these restrictions in, uh, except face coverings, in June. And so it's going to switch to much more of a personal responsibility. You know what you, you can do to stay safe um, and, and away from some of these shelter in place restrictions that we've been uh, living with for so long. Um, it doesn't mean COVID's gone away. It just means that the, the business and sector by sector restrictions, you know, what bowling alleys have to do, what movie theaters have to do, that that stuff is actually probably going to go away starting in the summer. Um, there will be a few things still in place. Worker safety rules from the state will still be in place, some, some other things, but, uh, but it's going to look very different. And that may happen before we make it to the yellow tier. Great. Thank you, Dr. Moss. Words from our Alameda County Health Officer. Uh, so we have reached time. Um, thank you all for your participation, the panelists, um, our interpreters, our behind the scenes folks, and all the questions. Um, we really want folks to continue to send questions to us. Um, and Jamie, correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe the email that we want you to send questions to is HCSA Community at acgov.org. You can always go to our website, the Alameda County website to get more information. Um, and we really hope that this has been a beneficial forum for everybody. Uh, we are piloting it tonight. And so if this is something that you would like to see this format in the future, please do let us know. Again, that email address, HCSA community at acgov.org. And I would like for our three panelists just to leave us with a few parting words and then we will close the session. And why don't we start with you, Dr. Noha. Well, I liked what Dr. Moss just said. Um, you know, restrictions will start to loosen up, but I think that makes um, really the responsibility on each and every individual to exercise that responsibility and understand your own personal risks. 
Um, and so we just really want everyone to be cautious. I can tell you as someone who's been working on the ground with this throughout the pandemic, I am bracing myself for that moment that Dr. Moss is talking about as restrictions loosen up and people do more traveling and variants that we're seeing in other parts of the world keep getting imported everywhere. Um, so I don't wanna end on a down note. I am just going to try to reinforce what Dr. Moss said about continuing to be responsible and vigilant irrespective of, of whether the bowling alley is open or not is that you're going to be mindful of that masking, the distancing, um, avoiding crowded indoor spaces, um, ensuring your spaces are ventilated. If you can do it outdoors, do it outdoors. Um, and yeah, want everyone to, um, but also, you know, if you're fully vaccinated and so are your folks, you know, enjoy that time together. We deserve it. Um, you know, get some hugs in and stuff like that too. So continue taking good care of yourself. Thank you, Dr. Noha. Dr. Moss. Uh, yeah, I would echo what uh, Noha said, and and I would um, add, um, and I think you know Noha touched on this before as well. You know, COVID is is probably not going away anytime soon, and um, I I'm coming to the belief that either you're going to get vaccinated or you're going to get COVID, and maybe more than once. And so I think people need to just start, um, you know, assuming that that that's the choice, and and it's okay. Um, that it's a choice, but um, that's why we're out here really, um, you know, speaking to the benefits of vaccination. Um, and um, and uh, again, yeah, it's kind of a down note, but, but I also think there is cause for hope. We're in a better place than we were. We know a lot more and we have these great tools to help um, try to keep ourselves and each other healthy. Thank you, Dr. Moss. And Kimmy, we will end with you. Okay. So uh, my parting words would be, um, take this opportunity to get all the information that you need to get comfortable with testing, to get comfortable with masking if you're still not sold on it, to get comfortable with the distancing, to get comfortable with vaccination. We will be with this for a while, as our physicians have said, and our commitment is to making sure that there's information, there are resources for you in your community. And when you decide that you want to get vaccinated, there will be a vaccine location near you. Thank you so much, Kimmy. That's great. Thank you all for being here. And we hope this session tonight has allowed you to uh, get some more information to make your decisions. And that's really what we're aiming to do. Thank you all so much and be well. Have a good evening.